Today, I want to concentrate on one piano concerto, which I think truly demonstrates Mozart's coming of age as a composer. And I'm joined by the Dutch pianist Ronald Brattigam, playing on a forte piano, very much like the one Mozart would have played, and my own specially concocted period instrument orchestra, Harmony Band. The piece in question is the piano concerto number 20 in D minor, which is one of a set of concerti that Mozart wrote for subscription concerts that he was putting on in Vienna. But this particular concert where this piece was premiered was of utmost importance to Mozart because his father was going to be there. He hadn't seen his father for a number of years. So in many senses, he was wanting to impress. <laughs> indeed is the tune in the opening of this extraordinary and very great concerto. This is the hallmark of a musician absolutely at the height of his power, a composer in full control who knows absolutely how to raise the ante, how to create an atmosphere and a situation of almost palpable tension and excitement. What does he do? He creates a non-tune, tunes invariably used to create emotional colour and texture in music. By this time in Mozart's life, doesn't need to write a tune. He creates it purely and simply through this funny little motif, which is syncopated, which is a device he uses a lot in his music, so that it's never actually on the beats, it's just in between the beats, in the cracks, if you like. So we're going to play now just a bit that follows directly from that and see if we can get a sense of the flames being fanned, the building sense of something big that's going to happen. Yeah, good. So with that figure, can we just build it up through? Da ya da, bu ya da, bu ya da, down the other side, and then da ya da a bit more. So just each time, a step more, a step more. Here we go. Then in a minute or two, we get to the second theme of the piece, which is slightly more of a tune, but still not that much. And there's a really plaintive quality to this, the oboe and bassoon entry. The first sense, perhaps, of child talking to father. <laughs> You get even more sense of falling down onto that bar line. Tardy, down. Really, really plaintive. And a bit more now. Where's he going? And then we get an extraordinary line in the violas and cellos and basses and also in the bassoons, a sinewy chromatic line. Again, where's he going? Where's he taking us? And of course, he's just playing with us because he brings us back to D minor. Let's put everyone together on that moment. Now we come on to the first entry of the solo piano. Again, a very plaintive theme, no drums and alarms here at all. What's interesting is that it's not music derived from anything we've so far heard. You know, traditionally in concertos, the orchestra perhaps preview what the soloist then performs. Not so here, a completely new theme. And what's truly remarkable, I think, is the way that it just grows out of the orchestra. Mozart had this phrase he used time and time again, which was il filo, the thread. So there is a sense of absolutely organic, no line broken in the way that the piano joins and the orchestra retreats. We'll play from just before there. Listen to this really lifeless, bloodless theme that you get in the first violins.
once again, we're back to the opening material. He keeps coming back to it. It's like um, a touchstone for this movement as a whole. Now, we had that entry of the woodwind just now with the piano. There's an extraordinary passage later on of dialogue, really genuine dialogue uh, between the winds and the piano, the like of which you wouldn't have heard previously, certainly in the year of the harpsichord, because the harpsichord could never really have made the kind of impression that this newly modified forte piano that Mozart had at disposal in Vienna really could. We we'll play that again now, um, and listen out particularly to what the bassoon is doing as much as anything else. Great thing about wind writing in Mozart's work that it. Uh, the winds achieved an emancipation that hadn't been the case before. They were really free to do so much more with the piano in this instance. Now we get to a real excitement point for the solo pianist, the cadenza, which literally means a flourish. Up until just the early Haydn, I suppose, and very early Mozart, cadenzas had always been something which were improvised by the soloist as a chance to show off both their virtuosity, their extraordinary technique, and looking at ways of playing with all the themes which have so far been represented in the piece. Now, by Mozart's time, generally speaking, he's starting to actually write them down to fix them in time, I suppose. But what's exciting about this concerto is that he was in such a hurry to finish it, indeed, with the last movement, apparently the ink was still wet when they gave the performance. They didn't have a chance even to rehearse it. So he inevitably made up his own cadenzas. Beethoven wrote some subsequently, which some performers choose to play with this piece. But to be honest, they sound like from another world. So our pianist, Ronald Bradicum, improvises his own. <laughs> there. Sorry to stop you, Ronald, but it just completely taking us where we think we're about to start again. Always puts the musicians and certainly the conductor on edge. Is this going to be the moment when we rejoin or not? But no, Ronald goes off somewhere else. <laughs> 